These are two boys whose lives were extinguished. Carbon capture, there, there's a number of techno fixes that are about eliminating carbon from the atmosphere once it's produced. A bill like this doesn't address how are we reducing what is being produced to begin with. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The killers are rejoicing. I'm talking about the heads of the Israeli government who attacked Gaza so fiercely this month, killing and injuring hundreds of Palestinians. And they didn't lose any soldiers of their own. So they conceive of this as a blazing success. Perhaps privately, they call it Operation Win the Next Israeli Election. For the families of the 17 Palestinian children killed in their operation, it was quite something different. Last week we had a picture of one of the first, Allah Kadum, five years old. These are two boys whose lives were extinguished. This girl suffered for four days before dying. This, in my opinion, is an excellent piece of art. The artist Duniana Al-Amour was 22 years old, a college student. She won't make any other. She was cut down in Gaza. We said last week, remember the order of events. The Israelis arrested an Islamic Jihad leader on the West Bank. There was no violent response. Israel then shut down their communities in, in the south. There was no violent response. Then Israel started bombing the Gaza Strip. Israel didn't bother to use the usual excuses about retaliation. They openly called it a preemptive strike. Their goal, they said, was to prevent rocket attacks on Israel. But when they bombed Gaza, there was rocket attacks. Besides the 48 Palestinians who were killed, there were over 300 injured. Now, injured doesn't sound so bad. You go on living. This is Rahaf Suleiman, a Palestinian girl from Gaza. This is what she looked like before the attack. Trigger warning, I'll show you now a picture of her in bandages. This is her after she lost both legs and an arm, courtesy of the IDF. There were protests, hundreds gathered in New York City holding signs of people who were killed. Another child who was killed was five years old, but one was even younger, four years old. Some of what I showed you was terrible, but now I'm going to show something disgusting. No, not a body or an injury. A tweet by the mayor of New York City. Here he expresses full solidarity with the Israeli massacre, stating the lie that Israelis were only defending themselves. Two items about buses. On August 4th, about 50 Palestinian workers were made to get off a bus in the city of Bnei Brak in order to accommodate three Jewish passengers who refused to ride with them and demanded the driver force them off. One of the Jewish passengers claimed to be a transportation ministry official. Here's a quiz question. 
a group of 20 men verbally and physically assaulted a woman. They hated the fact that she was sitting in the front of a bus. So where and when did this take place? In the Old South in the 1950s? Or in Germany in the 30s? No, it was Jerusalem this month, and the victim was a Jewish woman. They pulled her hair, they put a smelly sock near her nose, they called her a dirty word describing non-Jewish women. They tried to prevent her from calling the police on her cell. The men's, the men's excuse was that their actions were done for religious reasons. No one was arrested. American Jews, is this the Israel you were taught to admire? Now from an interview I did with Benishi Albert. She's the co-executive director of the Climate Justice Alliance, which is made up of 83 frontline groups, many of them from indigenous nations. She herself is from the Anishabe and Yuchi nations, and lives in Oklahoma. We saw your recent press release, release which is very critical of the Manchin Biden so-called Inflation Reduction Act. You say that there are benefits in the bill for frontline and environmental justice communities, but quote, the harms far outweigh the benefits, unquote. Could you explain? So, you know, there's there's a number of provisions in there that EJ communities have long fought for and, you know, you know, things around like reductions to to greenhouse gases that, that can look like. But a lot of the a lot of what is in there is also tied to um, uh, incentives for build out and expansion of oil and gas development. And so that's a concern for us. Um, you know, and, and, you know, what is in there, um, both in the actual bill, but also what we're finding out in the last few days, and, and maybe you've heard that there was also a side agreement um, that was made around, um, you know, loosening up some regulations and permitting processes. Um, that piece of side agreement has a lot of harms in it for, for our communities and have great concern about that. Um, and so, yeah, while well, there's some good things there in there and then even on the economic side, you know, some things around prescription drugs and costs for insulin, which would be, you know, great for communities, um, communities of color. Um, there's also a lot of harms there around sort of expansion of permitting, um, you know, uh, loosening up or trying to um, uh, neutralize NEPA. Um, the Environmental, uh, National Environmental Protection Act. Um, and, you know, those are things that are meant to protect communities and be helpful communities. And so if those are under attack in a bill like this, then that's cause for concern for us. Now, in, in your language, you use the terms frontline communities, but I, I think many of our viewers don't know what that term means. Could you explain? So frontline communities are the communities that one, have been dealing with the effects of climate change for decades now, right? They, they have been experiencing extreme weather or flooding um, and or they're also frontline communities and that they live along the fence line or along um, polluting industries that cause harm to their communities. So, you know, both of those are, are what we think of, um, of being frontline communities, those who are being directly impacted um, by, you know, in the Gulf Coast, like people are experiencing extreme weather, loss of land, you know, in, in Alaska and in the Arctic area, like people are losing land into the water because of sea level rise. Like these are impacts of climate change that are happening that are impacting people and have been impacting people for decades. You say the bill would sacrifice frontline communities to subsidize an outdated industry. What do you mean by that? You know, the, the crisis that we're in with climate change means that we need to think about um, 
you know, energy and, and how we come about that energy in a much more different and dramatic way. Um, you know, we, we have a country who's, who is, um, its economy is largely dependent on oil and gas development, but that oil and gas development comes at a cost that is not just financial, but as in um, the impacts to like real communities and a human loss and a human cost. So, you know, we have to be able to think about like energy in a different way and how we come about that energy in a different way. And, you know, fossil fuel and our dependency on fossil fuel is, is an energy source that we have to like shift and move from and, and create a, um, a transition away from that to other more sustainable and renewable sources um, that costs that cause less harm to communities. Um, but even, you know, even with the oil and gas industry itself, like, you know, peak oil is a thing. Like we've been past the point of like peak oil and now oil is becoming harder and harder to come by. Um, and, you know, they're using much more aggressive strategies to like, you know, get oil out of tar sands and like different things. And so and fracking and so on, and fracking and so on, because it, it's just, it, it's harder to come by. So it's the industry itself knows that it's, it's changed, but it's hanging on and, and we're subsidizing that this bill helps subsidize like that hanging on and grasping for straws when we should be investing in renewable and more sustainable sources that are, that are, you know, vetted and engaged with, with communities and are, are led by communities to say, hey, this is the kind of energy that we want that doesn't cause harm to us or that is going to help, you know, uh, help clean up where we, where there's been pollution already. Now you talk negatively about something you call techno fixes. I assume one of those is carbon capture. Uh, can you explain what might be wrong with carbon capture? You know, I, carbon capture, there, there's a number of techno fixes that are about eliminating carbon from the atmosphere once it's produced. A bill like this doesn't address how are we reducing what is being produced to begin with? Like, how are we making regulations and restrictions on how much carbon can be produced in the be, in, in, to begin with? And instead, we have these fixes that say, all right, well, once it's produced, meaning like business as usual can go with production, but then we're going to figure out how to erase it from the air. Um, and so, you know, those technologies, um, many of them also have other uh, secondary pollutions or, you know, secondary harms that are caused from them. In addition to like, they also allow for the continued production of carbon and and some of them are being put into um, economic models, which then creates a dependency on carbon having to be produced in order for those to be economically viable for communities. So, you know, carbon capture sequestration has a number of technical issues that there are a number of scientists who say it's not even proven that they're effective um, at removing carbon in the way that they're being um, promoted and pushed out there. And, you know, there's other, there's other um, you know, technologies out there, everything from geoengineering trees to take out carbon more, or, you know, putting out like silicone beads on the Arctic ice to reflect the sun. Like there are a number of these like techno fixes that, you know, can cause other problems and other challenges. Um, and instead of us saying, hey, how about we reduce, we reduce the amount of carbon that we're making and look at energy in a different way. And uh, I, I saw on Food and Water Watch, they were talking about how the carbon capture has never been proven to work on any big scale. And the idea that you, you'd have a whole series of pipelines just for this, so we would have lots more pipelines on, on whose land, I don't know. Um, pretty amazing. Now, instead of this, uh, you talk about calling on the president to declare a climate emergency. If he did that, how would that help things? 
I, you know, I believe that declaring a climate emergency would cause agencies, you know, the federal agencies to have to look at how are we dealing with this as a crisis situation. These frontline communities have been calling for decades, not just years, but decades saying we are in a climate emergency and we've been dealing with this and they've been dealing with the harms for a long time now. So they want to see that. I think, you know, for the president. See the full interview on our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Now, here's something we didn't discuss about the Mansion biden climate bill. There are $30 billion of goodies for the nuclear power industry in that legislation, even though no one has an idea of what to do with the nuclear waste, and even though the Ukraine war shows that militarists are quite willing to put their artillery all right inside of the nuclear power facilities. We close with more of Simon Perani's talk about Ukraine. He had just finished speaking about Russia's recovery in the late 90s that was financed by the sale of their fossil fuels and metals. Here he responds to the charge that NATO was forcing its way into Ukraine. Now, the, the main chapter of NATO expansion started before that. Uh, 1999, they had a conference where a whole lot of states were kind of put on a membership, uh, whatever it's called, plan. And uh, 2004, all those states had joined, which included some of the Central European states, but also the Baltic states. Um, and uh, who, you know, they're not Mexico, right? The imperialist power they're worrying about is not over the border in the United States. They're in the Baltic states and therefore the imperialist power they're worrying about, which has invaded them at various times or you know, received uh, ownership of them thanks to secret deals between Stalin and Hitler, is Russia. So uh, you can see the logic uh, for the Baltic states. Um, the, uh, I mean, my understanding is that the, the First of all, there was no membership action plan and never has been for Ukraine ever. I mean, obviously, uh, NATO was anxious to build up a military relationship with Ukraine. It was doing that even uh, when Yanukovych was president, even before that. I mean, that's a long-standing thing. Uh, but the weapon supply until the last year was absolutely negligible. Um, and the progress in terms of Ukraine moving towards membership was negligible. That was complicated by the European Union. U Ukraine desperately wanted EU membership, as did Turkey. And neither of those countries was ever going to be allowed to get anywhere near that by uh, Germany and France in particular. Um, and yes, it's true that the Western powers did not want a strong Russian state but it's also true that the Western powers increasingly in this period from uh, 2000 onwards, when Putin is the president, uh, saw Russia as a gendarme, which they could use to maintain social control in the former Soviet territories. Uh, Chechnya has been mentioned, Georgia, there's the Russian attack on Georgia in 2008, but I think primarily in Syria and Ukraine. And of course, the Russian intervention in Syria came after the war in Ukraine started in 2014, but it's very clear that the message from the Western powers were, was, you can support Bashar al-Assad, you can massacre as many Syrians as you like, uh, you can use chemical weapons, you can do everything else, but just keep away from the Western air bases in the Middle East and you will be fine. And, you know, much as they all deny that there is a an arrangement with spheres of influence, that is a policy about spheres of influence. And the same was true actually with Ukraine. And it's notable that all the sanctions that were imposed on Russia after 2014 were imposed with respect to the annexation of Crimea, which was something that made the Western powers nervous and they regarded as unacceptable. There were no sanctions related to 
the support for the uh, right wing and fascist uh, elements that uh, were put in charge of these uh, so-called people's republics. Now, I'm going to be quick. And uh, Cheryl sent me a message uh, asking me very politely <laughs> to be quick. And uh, I've got so two more bits to this. One is the short term cause of the new phase of the war. I mean, the Minsk agreement was never going to work. Right. I and mean, people who follow this more closely than I do, that's that's their opinion. And I having read into it, I mean, I'm sure they're right. You know, the, the agreement was that there would be a, a measure of autonomy um, and that Russian forces would withdraw. But it's not specified in so-called Minsk II which way around that's going to happen. Right. So <laughs> it was never going to work. And it didn't work. And uh, Taras Bilus, actually, just when the, the current phase of the war started, wrote a very good article. Let's try and find that and, and share it. Uh, it he, he, explaining uh, that as a uh, socialist comrade in Kiev. I think that's very, very worth reading. Um, and I, th I think the I think it's significant that during the last couple of years, I don't think. I, I mean, a lot of Ukrainians said to me, and uh, we're, when we're talking about very tragic and uh, difficult things now, a lot of Ukrainians said to me in, in the course of March, well, we always knew this was going to happen. Not, not all, but a lot, of, a lot of people said, oh, we, we never thought this was going to happen. But there were some people who said, oh, we always knew this was going to happen. Well, I can tell you now, I did not know it was going to happen. But I, I also don't think, I don't think a lot of people in the Kremlin knew it was going to happen. I don't think this was a kind of pre... I think this was one possible option, which was obviously there for the Kremlin to take. And I think this is the way that the Kremlin operates, both in economic and in military terms, is that they keep their options open. I think Putin is extremely skilled in this respect. Um, they keep their options open. I think this was always one option, but I don't think it was the favourite one. And I think there was much more concentration when all those Russian troops were gathering on the border. And, you know, the US, uh, uh, the CIA, to be fair to them, were saying it's going to be an invasion. Um, and I think at that point that the, 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 what was definitely going to happen was something with respect to the People's Republics. They were handing out huge numbers of passports. More than a million passports were given out in 2021 to citizens of the Republic so that they would be citizens of the Russian Federation. And that trick was played in Georgia, you know, well, we're just moving our peacekeepers in to protect our citizens, that's all. Um, and this was all going on. There were changes in the administration of those republics. There was a lot more direct Russian involvement in the administration. So all that was happening. Uh, but I think also that as a result of things that have happened in Russia, we haven't had time to speak about, the protest movements, the failure of the Kremlin to deal with those, the, 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 the deteriorating condition of the economy uh, due to, you know, up until now, the low prices of oil that followed the 2015 crash, all sorts of other things. I think the Kremlin's domestic agenda was driving it more and more into a kind of ideological nationalism, uh, which was, you know, on speed, if you like. I mean, it's always been there, but it's been massively ratcheted up over the past year or so. Um, the much, much more extreme forms of repression domestically. And I think it's all that that plays into the decision then, which, of course, was a, a, a catastrophic, um, a, you know, there was a catastrophic, from the Kremlin's point of view, underestimation of how Ukraine as a country would respond. But all that played into the decision to invade on the 24th of February. Now, I, I'm going to finish just very quickly this seventh point about what the national question means in the 21st century. I mean, it's more to raise a question than to tell you what my answers, in because, answers are because I don't know what they are. Um, I had a, uh, for many years, I thought that the education, if you like, that I had had as a Marxist about uh, the, the issue of national liberation um, was wanting. And the reason I thought it was wanting more than anything was that I couldn't see any progressive role being played by the bourgeoisie in countries, whether uh, in Latin America or in Africa, um, or, uh, or, or whether, uh, you know, bureaucratic formations like in Vietnam, particularly, I spent a lot of time uh, looking at the 
uh, Vietnamese regime and, and the role. And I couldn't see any really socially progressive politics or anything to do with what I would think of socialism coming from these regimes. So I thought that the part of the schema which was prevalent in the Marxist movement in the early 20th century about uh, you know the, the 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 not only that nations had a right to resist colonialism but that there was a a progressive aspect to that nationalism I thought was wrong and I still think it, it, I still think we've moved past that period of history where in the history we're in the globalized form of capitalism uh, where empires uh, are neo-colonialist and economic rather than direct very often but I don't see anything progressive um, inherently you know and I don't see very much progressive just uh, you know from the evidence before our eyes of any of these national uh, bourgeoisies that find themselves resisting colonialism however I mean I think more than ever now actually as a result of the events of the last few months I mean I do think there is a right to resist um, which is something that you know I would embrace uh, as part of my socialist understanding of the world and that is not conditional and it's not kind of um uh, and, and it's not limited by the fact of, of whatever uh however i might see uh the bourgeoisie in ukraine or any other country the q a was only partially recorded i asked a question and played devil's advocate and asked him what influence he thought U.S. official Victoria Nuland had in overthrowing the Yokanovich government. His answer was none. Now, something that seems dead wrong, the way the FBI executed a search warrant for the African People's Socialist Party. A whole team of FBI in battle gear showed up using flash grenades with drones buzzing about. A couple in the St. Louis home was held in handcuffs while the FBI did their search. And then when the search is, was done, they just let these people go. Nobody was arrested. As far as I know, there was no reason to believe that Omali Yeshatela, the target of the raid, would violently resist a legal search. I'm not vouching for the group, don't know anything about them. If they were doing work for the Russians, I would condemn it. But what the FBI did in the raid seems way bad. And the hypocrisy. I don't remember anybody in handcuffs during the search warrant raid at mar a lago for more on this see august 12th on democracy now that's our program for today see you next week at this time i'm stanley heller for the struggle